This is One on One. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in Lincoln Center, the heart of Manhattan, New York City. We are pleased to welcome all the way from Washington, D.C., Mr. Hillary O. Shelton, director of the Washington Bureau and senior vice president for advocacy and policy for the NAACP. Good to see you, sir. Well, it's great to be with you, and thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. Uh, today, most interesting time maybe ever in our country, and well, I shouldn't say that, given the civil rights movement and everything connected to it, I often think about race relations today, sure. and in my sense, fearing, thinking we're further apart than ever. Am I wrong? Yes. I, I think the problem we're having now is that you talked about the 60s and how tough things were coming through the civil rights era and so forth. We thought we'd move past a lot of these things. And what we found out is that many of them were just kind of germinating on the ground. And sadly and unfortunately, we're at a time when the dog whistle is saying to too many people that it's all right to hold these prejudicial and racial feelings. It's all right to even say them. A lot of them are keeping them to themselves. We wrote us off as much, much of a fringe. We can't say that as much as we're seeing what's going on, and sadly. I wouldn't say things are getting worse. I say it's oftentimes before we can solve these problems, they have to kind of show their ugly faces, and we have to address them head on. My fear, I get a lot of fears, you notice, is that we're having a hard time even talking to each other as opposed to talking past each other. And I don't see... I want to be positive here, so help me. Where, where do you see a positive conversation about race taking place, other than what we're trying to, we do here all the time here on public television? Go ahead. No, well, first, you guys do a wonderful job on public television, and we're grateful for that. You're willing to ask the hard questions and have the conversations. More of America needs to do that. But as I look around the country, I see communities that are willing to do it, to take on the conversation, to raise the issue from various racial and ethnic minority perspectives and, and majority perspectives as well. So it's good to see some of what's going on, and a lot of those coalitions have grown stronger. Mm. For instance, if you look at Black Lives Matter. I was just gonna ask you about that. Absolutely, most people think of, the, of it as a movement that is of just African Americans, and it's not. If you watch your television monitors and you see whenever there's a demonstration, they are some of the most diverse demonstrations you've ever seen. Racial and ethnic minorities and others, from all people of different orientations mm. and, and points of, personal, of, a, of, of, or, of orientation that have come together because they're taking on the issues now more than ever. I'd argue that social media mm. has, has played, it helped to hurt? Has helped quite a bit. Because it also is an issue of perspective. If you go up, we still have rather polarized communities. Absolutely. Racial and ethnic minorities have a tendency to live in communities that are very much those racial and ethnic minority groups and white Americans as well, it's just whatever the uh, similarities are. We kind of move into communities that we see people most like ourselves. So as we're looking at what's going on, we know that part of the struggle is making sure that we understand each other's perspectives. Social media has truly given us that gift of seeing those perspectives. Good example, policing in our country. We've seen so many cases of unarmed African-American men and women actually finding themselves being gunned down by road police officers in, in many cases. And I'd also want to go on record saying most police officers are quite The blind. vast majority. The vast majority. We have a few bad apples, and those we have to address, and they, they make the Problems wrong Problems you have a bad apple with a gun and a badge. It's That's just it. a bad apple. It, it, it's exactly right. It's a well-armed bad apple, and mm. that becomes extremely problematic, as we saw in the Michael Brown case uh, and, and other cases across the country. But with that, we know that in some communities, the, the relationship is quite different. In some communities, he's officer friendly. In other communities, he's the officer that is part of an occupying force. Mm. So perspective becomes important too. The experiences in our community have had a tendency not to be understood because it's not consistent with their experiences. So if I told you that officer friendly, whenever he stops me, slaps me up against the wall, treats me very badly, calls me names and so forth, you say that is not consistent with my experiences. And that would be an honest answer. So it's hard to come and to, to engage mm. ourselves together when you have that well, problem. What I'm curious also about is this. The Black Lives Matter movement, we've interviewed so many people and tried to understand the movement and feature some of those folks. Some of those rallies, and right here in the New York area, sure. you've had some. You were talking about cops, mm -hmm. a few bad apples. You've had some in the Black Lives Matter movement during rallies yelling in a rally, in a march, that they advocate directly violence and potentially the killing of police officers. And, 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 and so 
How is that dealt with? Because there are some mm -hmm. disproportionately white who say, see? Exactly. See? Exactly. And you say? Well, look, I'll add that what happened in Houston. As a matter of fact, That's you had right. a, a very uh, nonviolent Black Lives Matter march. Right. And one guy on the fringes decided that he would bring out his entire arsenal and decide to start Just takes a police officer. It's outrageous. But that person's inconsistent. And one of the things I really appreciated about Houston, as I would here as well, the Black Lives Matter organizing force held a press conference the next day and clarified that this is not what we stand for. We've had problems in many marches and demonstrations with those that would come in and instigate. Not Dr. Part King of had to deal with that as well. Absolutely. And at the NAACP, we too. And we've had to work very hard to make sure we have marshals in place and others to make sure the message is clear. When those things happen, you obfuscate the message. And that creates other problems. Mm. The reason you held the march in the first place was to get a message across. When someone engages themselves along those lines, bringing violence and, and destruction and other things, it actually creates a bigger problem yep. in getting that message. Let me, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. When the issue of race is talked about out of the uh, White House, the Trump White House, President Donald Trump's White House, there was a quote, something he came up with, I just, it ruminates in my mind. I am, they quote, the quote, least racist person you know. I know you remember exactly where you were when you heard it. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah. You thought what? I, I thought that he probably doesn't truly understand the definition of racism, that he feels that way, as many others have in the past. If you, talk to, if you go way back to the George Wallaces of the world and, and others, you'll find that they didn't think of themselves as being racist, but their policies were. Most people don't define racism with that power dynamic. Here you have arguably the most powerful man in the United States of America, and some would say throughout the world, right. that very well has the power to do what he wants to. If you come with that with prejudicial perspectives, or a lack of a clear understanding of race relations and other issues in our country, then what you'll end up with is racist policies. What you'll end up with is being the person that is actually implementing racist issues and otherwise. So when he says that, what I see is someone that hasn't truly come to understand what the issues are or what is, what is needed of the community. So, so, so go all the way back. Um, he was not president. Mm -hmm. But when Donald Trump was taking out full-page ads here in the New York area and sure. the tabloids and newspapers, calling for the death sentence for the Central Park Five, when in fact later on with DNA evidence, those young men were... They, they were innocent. They right. didn't do it. Do, do you think in any way the president thinks, you know what, there was a degree of prejudice and or racism involved in my doing that, and I need to atone for... It? Do you think there's any sense of that? It should be that way. We haven't seen that with this president. I do not know if it's because of his experience as a businessman. Right. That, that as a businessman, you can't be wrong to be able to push your agenda. Why is through. it different when you're president? And well, by the way, what, what's the role of the NAACP in helping this administration, which means this country? Go ahead. No, very well. As president, you, you are representing all the people. You are that elected representative that's the face and the voice of the American. Not just, quote, your base. Not just your base. The entire country. You're paid by the entire country. When you're sworn in, you're sworn in to represent and protect and advance the policy agenda and others of the entire country. That is your job. That's what you're given the responsibility of fulfilling. If he's locked into that base where he feels like in business negotiations, you're negotiating for one entity. And that's what he spent his entire life doing. Well, how, how, how's the NAACP, how have you engaged him? Absolutely. We've made sure that we've gotten the message across that he's wrong on some of these You ever issues. sit across from him? Not yet. No, no. But we will welcome the opportunity has to do just Has he come that. to an NAACP annual event? No, he, he hasn't. Was, he, when he was a candidate, did he come? He did not come, and he was invited. I want to put on the record that as well. We want to hear from everybody that wants to be How about if you said, you, quote, most folks in your organization are not going to support me anyway. Does that make sense? It doesn't. As a matter of fact, if, if you understood the history, this is where understanding comes into very much play. African Americans were overwhelmingly Republican when That's they right. came out of slavery. Tell folks when that changed. Absolutely. It, it changed during uh, the, the, the Southern movements. That's right. As a matter of fact, of the Southern strategy to be able to pull more of the right-wing racists that were, felt like they couldn't go home after the, the, uh, uh, the civil rights uh, plank of the 1964 Democratic Convention was That's passed. Right. They felt they couldn't go back home and support these newfangled policies that said that all of us are equal mm. and that very well you shouldn't be able to discriminate against anyone. That's what that civil rights plank did in shorthand. 
So in essence, we think about it in those terms. What we ended up with is, is a party that decided to open their arms to those for political reasons, but not for social value. Before I let you out of here, I don't want to ask a big picture question, but how confident and hopeful are you that a meaningful dialogue can take place, not, in place, not just to understand the, the plight of those who are Af African American in this country, but also for those who are African American to understand some of the frustration that those who are not African American have about a whole range of issues, be it affirmative action quotas or at least their interpretation of it, uh, their frustration economically. Can we do that without, hey, listen, I've suffered more than you and the finger pointing, do you believe we can do that? I believe we can, because it's really all about understanding the different perspectives that are part of this country. We are arguably the most diverse nation on the face of the earth. Our people come from all over the world bringing Including difference. Africa. Absolutely. Including all, Haiti. Including Haiti, including other places that he used a very derogatory term to describe, and that's sad again, that he's locked into that perspective. But I don't think he has the people around him to help him understand what's really going on. Omarosa, Omarosa wasn't getting it done? Well, she wasn't, and Omarosa's a friend of mine. So, so very well, she is someone that was part of that movement that we've talked to on a regular basis, and the problems were very much there. I believe she tried. But um, um, the, the other powers that were moving, and of course, a, a, almost a laser beam interest in getting reelected has actually set aside many of these opportunities. Mm -hmm. What's that last, last question for Larry? The solar, um, the solar equity initiative, give me 30 seconds on that. Well, we've got to make sure that we include greater diversity among that initiative. What we found out with the research is that the diversity is not there of those who are involved with these programs. And in essence, it's been a challenge for the, um, for the, the, for the movement of solar and other renewable energies. We've got to make sure we recognize where people are, what their real needs are, mm. and very well how they can benefit from it, and how we can be more direct about recruiting people into a movement rather than seeing that we've fallen short in our diversity. Uh, Mr. Hillary Shelton is director of Washington, uh, Washington Bureau and senior vice president for advocacy and policy at an extraordinary organization that is as relevant today as ever, uh, the NAACP. Um, what year? Uh, Created 1909. 1909. And we, we just had a birthday two days ago. Did in fact Thurgood Marshall argue the case Brown versus Board of Education? Um, be, obviously, as an attorney for the NAACP. Uh, technically, he was with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund at the time he argued the case. It. But it, came, it was our general counsel. And but you have to look at that team of lawyers that he brought with him. They were as diverse as America again. And then became a historic figure on the Supreme Court. Thank you Absolutely. so much, Mr. Chairman. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Northward Center, Georgian Court University, NJM Insurance Group, the Fidelco Group, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, and by Johnson & Johnson. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.